And thanks also to ESS for, for pulling this all together. Uh, it's really a great series. Um, I was really delighted to be part of it. Uh, just a little bit about my background. I, um, I come from, uh, I studied composition and theory and violin, you know, as a student. And um, in graduate school, computer music. Um, I worked in games for a while, but most of my life I haven't been involved in, uh, in audio. I've been doing digital libraries and digital humanities and cool stuff I like. <laughs> it's a whole other story. But uh, uh, I've just come back to this probably in the last five, six years. And it's taken me back to where I started, which was uh, I was always drawn to recorded sounds and music concrete, as we said at the time. And um, even back with tape and modular units, you know, for processing and so on. Um, and then over the years, started using C-Mix and C-Sound basically for mixing and processing. And then at one point, I became aware that Apple had a uh, 3D audio library built into their, into their sound platform on their phones. I think it was OAL. And I started doing some software for this because it could move sounds, sources, and also listeners around the room. But the problem with that is it, you know, it's, it's awkward and it's, it's not a good composition environment. So if you want to make music or even you want to make 3D scenes, it's an awkward way to do it. And so at some point I became aware of the game development engines, Unity being one of them, and uh, I had an opportunity to do a project this is because of Stefan, Stefan Moore, who unfortunately isn't here tonight, he's in California. But um, he was doing a show of uh, video game art that was uh, focused on sound rather than sound being the, you know, supporting player. And, you know, said, can you do a piece on that? So I, that's how I got involved with Unity. And then coming to Cleet, same thing. It just seemed totally natural to be working in a 3D environment for 3D sound and then casting uh, those events outward to the uh, dispersion system, in this case, Cleat. So I, um, I want to play some projects for you. I want to dig into them and show you how they're built. I have a few slides, which I, I hope will be useful, uh, offer useful illustrations. But most of all, we want you to come away with something useful to you. <laughs> so um, please, uh, steer things in a direction that is useful to you. And certainly, if we don't get there or you'd like to go deeper afterwards, let me know. I'd love, I'd love to talk to you. Um, I want to show you one more slide that just kind of shows this breakdown that I was describing. Um, to the right of that uh, vertical line, you see audio signal. And from the bottom up is basically the system here. You'll recognize the 16 speakers. Back here, there's a rack that has four four-channel amps in it that are driving the speakers. And plugged into those amps is a, uh, a USB-based uh, uh, you know, interface, 16 in and 16 out. And then to, you know, to work with this system, basically, you connect anything to that. And um, people use a lot of different things. Uh, what I'm going to show tonight, um, I don't know if anybody else is doing this. It might be totally, uh, you know, idiosyncratic. But uh, I just want it to be clear that you can use whatever you're comfortable with to try to do something like this. Um, the other point I would make with this particular architecture or division of labor is um, I've I do pieces, I've done pieces in here, I've done pieces for eight channel ring you know, configurations. And from my point of view, that's mostly just a different, uh, well, okay, this is exaggeration. It, on, the, on the audio side, it's a different speaker configuration. And so, and I, you know, my, my uh, patches, and we'll look at this, um, take speaker coordinates, you know, as part of their configuration. So, uh, a couple of years ago, we did, uh, we did a program with ESS, um, excuse me, yeah, with ESS in um, Millennium Park, and there there were 30, right? So same thing. And beyond that, there are also ambisonic encoders, uh, which you can use to um, create ambisonic files that can be played 
you know, in various environments. The, um, sorry, Ralph? I can't hear you. Oh, okay, a question in a minute. Um, I'll just um, talk about the rest of this slide. On the left, you see Unity. And within Unity, um, I use some third-party uh, assets. There are lots and lots of them at the Unity Asset Store. One of which I one of, one that I use is an is a um, uh, an OSC plugin, and I've created a few um, OSC commands that I use to send from Unity to Max. And so the basic architecture is I'll do a reset to Max from Unity just to kind of clean things up. Um, anytime a sound plays, like any of these little birds that you hear, anytime a sound plays, a play sound file command is sent to, uh, to Max. And then anytime it moves, uh, a position XYZ command is sent. And so that's basically the connection between the Unity side and the Max side. And one of the nice things about Unity is you can, you can deploy on all kinds of different platforms uh, for playing games. I typically deploy or, or do a build for iOS so I can run these programs on my phone. And, um, but I've, I've, I've built one for, uh, for Android and it, it started up. I don't know that much. I don't know how well it's done. I gave it to Stefan a little while ago. I don't have an Android device to test on. And I've built it for Mac OS. And the others I just show for, for completeness. Okay, let's see. Okay, yeah, so let's go into, um, let's go into the patch that we're listening to. I'm going to bring it up a little bit, and then I'm going to talk about... Oh, wait, sorry, Ralph. Yeah. Um, so the question that I had was, so um, for the OSC controls that you're using in Unity, um, is that the... Is that the only way that you know of to to spatialize audio within Unity that you're using, or is that uh, just like your preferred method? Oh, good question. Yeah. So that question went on the stream, I think, probably, right? Okay. So I won't repeat any such questions. Yeah. Um, Unity has really nice spatializers itself. Uh, a default one, and I was using one from Google for a while that had, that incorporated the um, had related transfer functions, you know, the PINA, um, and it had really good spatialization. And um, they also have spatializers for um, you know 7.1, 5.1 quad. They don't have a 16. I think you know it, it's it gets a little dicey in, in there, uh, at least in my experience. Um, I really like their binaural uh, stereo spatializer. In fact, I'm doing these pieces on these various speaker configurations, but I think of the music as natively uh, as apps that you listen to with headphones on your phone. To me, that's the best sound. It has the best special spatialization. But it's huge fun to come into a space like this and have everything be out in the open and people to be in it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, for OSC, you had X, Y, and Z. Can you talk about the Z axis? Yeah, the Z axis is, uh, we're basically, and Y and Z are kind of flipped in different environments, and so you have to be really careful <laughs> in that regard. But basically, X, of course, is left to right. And um, I use Y as up and down, and Z as forward and backward. But some, in some environments, we, you know, Y is forward and backward, and, and Z is up and down. And that's one thing you got to keep track of when you're going across the thing. So in this system, how do you control the up and down? Is, is that strictly like a function of change? It, it, it's strictly, it's, it's, it's gain and, and low-pass low filtering. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit, um, but yeah, that's... Right, when you're talking about a flat grid like this, I think that's your question, Scott, right? Is it, yeah, how do you get height? You know, you're not in like an Atmos system or, or uh, um, you know, ambisonic where you have low speakers. So you really don't get those, but you know, you, you, you fake it. Um, 
let's see. I want to I want to show you a little bit, and I assume that there's interest in this. If not, you know, you can wave me wave me on. Um, this is um, and this is the kind of the crudest Unity um, project that I'm going to show you tonight. This is the one I've been I did a couple of years ago, and I've just been building on. Um, basically, those 16, that's that grid of uh, red balls are the speakers here, um, proportionally arranged. And those, those birds moving around are just different flocks, and each flock has um, a characteristic and sounds associated with it. And I will use flocks for birds, uh, of course, and also for animals, for gibbons, you know, monkeys. But I also use it for, uh, for traffic and use it for uh, weather, for thunder and wind. Uh, so it's a really nice kind of uh, simple way to do really fluid animation uh, easily. You know. And a lot about what I'm doing here is attaching a sort of a sound uh, music architecture on that, which I'll show you. Um, just FYI, the, the basic, uh, what we're looking at here on the front, this is a Unity editor. And down below are various assets um, organized you know, in a folder structure that you can bring into a scene. Up on the left here, we're looking at one particular scene, and on the left here are all the various assets that are running in it. And f so, for example, I have all these bird flocks. I have some I call near, some I call far. You can guess that the farther ones are farther away from the grid and the nearer ones are right in it. Um, and these are all, you know, just kind of moving around. If we look at the flock itself, I just clicked on a flock. The flock uh, asset is a third party asset, which um, I bought. It was very inexpensive uh, probably five years ago, four or five years ago, and I've gotten so much use out of it. And basically, you know, you tell it what's the bounding box of your flock, how far can they roam, uh, how many are in the flock, uh, what's, how close do they need to be together, what's their kind of group bounding box, if you will, as they move around the larger one, uh, what are, what's their speed range, uh, what's their diving range, you know, for heights. Um, and it does the rest. It's, it's quite wonderful. Um, I've added some other features, which I'll get into a little more detail. But these are, these are all components on the right, components of this flock over here that I clicked on. And you can add your own components. And components can be uh, software, uh, typically C Sharp, though I understand you can also use JavaScript. And it could be as simple, really simple as anything, or as complex as anything. The more complex you are, you have to think about uh, you know, how does it fit in the overall architecture so you're efficient in how it executes. So that's, that's the basic um, kind of organization of um, one of these scenes. And it's sending the message over here to this patch. And you can see on the left here um, the different, the number is the channel number. I just use kind of arbitrary uh, numbers, like accession numbers. So to coordinate uh, an object on the right in the game with a sound and a position on the left in Max. And that channel number, virtual channel number, is what, what you're seeing here. I'm seeing it move around. Uh, OK, let's see. I'm going to bring up a different patch and a different different game. Uh, let's see. In the meantime, okay, yeah, we looked at this. Uh, this this company that makes the flocks is called Unluck, and this is the component we looked at. In the center here is a page, their page out of the uh, Unity Asset Store, which is worth checking out. Uh, they have all kinds of visual effects and objects, but also a lot of things that have to do with sound, uh, some spatial sound and processing. Okay. Um, in the Max patch, the basic operation is uh, a roll-off. 
And essentially, all the sounds that are being played um, are entering the patch and are, uh, are heard to varying degrees at all the speakers. Um, now, the varying degrees depends on what's the roll off. You know, how tight are you going to roll off the sound of that object from the speakers around it? And here we see three different, three different uh, examples. In roll off one, you, you see a bird going by, and the roll off is spanning, you know, two two speakers approximately, and so it has a little more range in the grid. The one above it. It's much more narrow, and theoretically, it'd be possible for you to never hear it except when it's right under a speaker, you know. And um, and then this one over here is is kind of in between, and also shows that it's coming from the outside. And so the challenge of getting the roll-offs right is really key, because if it's too tight, uh, I mean, if it's tight, you want it tight for good locality, because if it's tight, you're really gonna you're really going to hear, you're going to pinpoint that sound that's moving around rather than just kind of washing across the whole whole space. If it's too broad, well, it's everywhere, or it's just kind of washing across the whole space. And depending on, you know, your sounds, depending on the environment, the speaker, the distances between them, that all changes. So um, so that's that's a factor. Because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not producing sound that's going directly to a speaker, to an address speaker. I'm basically producing sounds, and then over that or under that, I, I have a sieve, so to speak, that is allowing things through to, to the grid. Yeah, question. So this, to me, immediately makes me think of sampling theory, that you have mm -hmm. the distances between your speakers, distances within a sampling grid. So wouldn't the Nyquist limit figure in here and the roll-off radius that would guarantee you always getting the sound would have to be a little more than twice the distance between any two of your sampling points which is 58 speakers? Yeah, it might help. And uh, it, it would help in the process of, of, the function is basically a Gaussian function with an exponent. And I set those, the, the exponent um, factor um, as, a, as a parameter. And that determines the spread. Right? That determines the spread. And then since it, it'll spread the energy out, uh, you know, the, the higher it goes, um, it tends not to be as loud at any particular point. So I have a kind of a gain compensating factor for that as well. So yeah, I could, kind of in the way that you're describing, I could probably accurately derive what the coefficient should be, you know, for a given situation. And understanding, you know, Nyquist and, you know, half sampling yeah, I mean, I, I might be part of that, but I don't do that. I just kind of guess and then I listen and I go from there. Just saying, it doesn't seem to take, take a lot of uh, math to do it. Anyway. No, no, not really. Piggybacking off of that same question, um, do you ever find that uh, using different sample rates for the, the the content that you were trying to spread across your uh, your audio field, do you ever find that that changes? So that that changes the way that you're able to localize sound. Sampling rates. Whoops. I had my ears tested this morning, and I wish she were here because that sounds like <laughs> sounds like an audiologist question. Really, uh, I mean, I, yes, but there's other factors, you know, such as just how good are the speakers and what is the room doing. What is that? Oh, okay. So, I mean, these are these are good things to to kind of bring to the table when you're trying to do something. It's good knowledge to have, but it it's not. I haven't encountered it, and my my recordings um, are not as pristine as they need to be, and 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 are not at the sample rate that they maybe could be. Also, yeah. Um, I'm going to show you another project. This is this is a different patch, and I'm not going to go into it 
too much. It's the same principles. Um, but the, uh, the game, and I say game, it's not a game. <laughs> it's a little different. And um, the point with this one that I want to show you is in the last case we had, uh, we had cleat centered and we had stuff moving around it. This is a case where we have stuff moving around, but the stage is much larger than elastic. And so let's move cleat around the, the whole space as well. So let me start this. Whoa. This, this started as, um, you might recognize the, uh, the ground. You might recognize the floor on this. It started as a, um, I'm going to bring this up. How about now? Um, I learned that the uh, audio walk company, Echoes XYZ, uh, supports ambisonic files a few years ago. And um, I was doing these sort of generative ecologies and, um, I, and producing uh, ambisonic files as well. So I thought, I want to make a walk, you know, an audio walk that people can use through their app that takes them through different zones, uh, each of which is, um, you know, uh, heard in an ambisonic file. And I was trying to think of a place to do it. I was thinking north, south, you know, west. And I started with the central Chicago, which is the the Lurie Gardens, just south of uh, Millennium Park. And so um, what I did is, um, let me bring the camera down. Bring it up just a little bit. I brought it. And so. I took a third-party product that is designed for um, basically phones, for all the various kinds of uh, control gestures that you have in a phone. Um, but it works also on the desktop. And I use that as the um, sort of the player movement uh, widget. Not something I had to write. I just got it. And then I, I tucked it under the... Uh, the grid, you know, the cleat grid. And so as I move the player around, the, the, the grid moves around. And so what's happening over in Max is uh, same as we saw before, but I'm using a channel that I wasn't using before. I'm using channel zero to, uh, and you know, I don't want to get into a debate if that's the right way to do it. I have a few problems with that. But that's what's happening here is I'm using channel zero to send uh, the coordinates for the center, basically. And so, uh, you know, as I move this around, those numbers are being sent over to Max, and they're used in the calculation of the gain for each object relative to each speaker. Okay? Yeah. Is that happening? I don't think so. Well, it, I, I don't hear it. Is it come, are you getting it out of all speakers? Let me ask you that. Or just one and two? Here, here's a great thing. I'm, this is a great demonstration. OK, remember when I was talking about the, the, uh, the roll off? I've got it at 10. I'm going to bump it up to 20. Are they moving around? What? OK, good. Um, I know that it works, but you know how it is. Sometimes you get into a demo, and if you didn't check it two minutes ago, you're in trouble. So, um, so this is an example of moving this around. I have another one. I don't know if I'll bother getting it out, but 
the original field recording that I did was um, in Indonesia, uh, the birds you heard in the previous uh, tropical uh, environment. Um, I did in Indonesia, and um, from those field recordings, I took things that I recorded at different places, and I placed them on a map. I just basically got a satellite, you know, Google map, and laid it as the floor. And it spread over, you know, a large town. This is a this is a garden. It's bigger than that, elastic, but it's not, you know, the whole neighborhood. And so it's kind of fun to think about using Plea to explore different sonic environments in that way, and do it in a kind of a direct, um, you know, uh, a direct way spatially. Okay. Where is the sound of the bird coming from? Where does it sound like? Um, it's coming from the Max Patch, which is connected to the 16A. I understand that, but where is the actual bird sound? Could, could, could you be more specific? Oh, they are sound files. Uh, what does it have to do with the map, those sound files? Um, I'll get to that. But basically what it is is each flock has a um, uh, different states. You know, you think of a flock of like cardinals or robins. And they have their alert calls. They have their, uh, you know, their calls seeking friends or a mate or this is my place. You know, they have different types of calls, right? And each bird in the flock, in my flocks, can move through those different states. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to show, that's part of what I'm going to show you in, in almost next. Are those bird sounds in this area or mono? Uh, these are in mono. Okay. So you're saying the Well, it's 3D movement. There's vertical, X, Y, Z. How do you visualize the 3D movement like this? Um, attenuation and low pass filtering. So, uh, how do you see the model? Well, in the model, there's X, Y, Z. How it's cast in any particular um, system is going to be up to that, is going to be different for each system. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to show you one more thing with the birds, and it also demonstrates um, use of uh, it also demonstrates use of uh, the iPhone. Let's see. I'm not going to demonstrate logic. <laughs> I hit it by accident. Sorry. Um, my my wonderful wife Teresa is uh, uh, a wonderful artist, painter, and for the last I don't know three four years, she's been spending her summer months painting outdoors mostly garage doors. And she, she takes the same approach uh, to painting garage doors as she does painting, oil, painting canvas, except it's not as many layers, but still layered, and it's house paint. So you know, it, 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 it's economical, and it lasts a long time. And one of the things we've been talking about is how to combine our work and so we're thinking about um, a show that's a gallery show um, where different paintings contribute different players to the spatial sound in the gallery. And one of the ways we kind of started to, to do an integration is uh, with um, augmented reality. So I'm going to bring up a... Um,
put the mic down. Okay, I'm just going to mirror my phone on my computer so that you can see it on the projector. I'm just going to bring this up briefly to show you so I don't try to sneak some information. I forgot I was to use a mic. The point of this is to, <laughs> is to show the, the 3D uh, sound uh, environment attached to something in the space uh, where we are. And uh, unfortunately, I, for some reason, I, it's probably minor, but um, I don't want to take our time to track it down. I'm, I wasn't able to connect from my phone to, uh, to my laptop, so I can't be sending those OSC messages from my phone uh, to Max and the laptop. So you're not, that's why you're not hearing it over, uh, over the cleat speakers. But you get the idea. Yeah, good point. Sorry, I take some of these things for granted. Thank you, Patricia. Um, these are all um, these are all garage door paintings. This particular one is a double garage door. You can kind of in, in the book. Well, you can't really tell. There's no there's no context. 
And so you can be out in the alley. Actually, they're taking this garage down. So not this one, but about close to 50 others <laughs> that Trace has made. And we don't have AR on all of them, but uh, we have quite a few in our alley. And you can walk up and down the alley with your, you know, with the app and, and listen to the different environments. Um, this is the one, this one has birds, but not all of them do. Okay, let's, um, I'm going to put this away and then we'll move on. Can I ask a question? Yeah, question. Yeah, uh, the question was, okay, so you're in the alley, you see these garage doors. Um, essentially, how do you get to the app, or how do you, how do you know which one is one, which, which is which, or using, uh, you know, like QR codes or something, or pins? Um, we're, not, we're not there yet, but that's the idea, yeah. The app isn't, isn't out yet. Um, the app actually has a, a map on it and does mapping, so you can see where you are, and it has pins where the um, you know where the paintings are, so you could use that, so but also some, some kind of identification on the painting that could lead you know the viewer who happens upon it because they're walking their dog, you know, to to see see the rest of it would be a great idea. Okay, I want to show you um, a little bit about the data model, then I want to show you another project that isn't birds um, and involves live improvisation. Okay, so Greg had the question earlier about, um, you know, what is the correspondence, if I understood the question correctly, what is the correspondence between, you know, a bird uh, that we're looking at and a sound, you know, recording of a bird. How does that happen? And this table, uh, these are spreadsheets um, that are pulled from spreadsheet extracts, which I want to explain the whole kind of thing to you. Um, I mentioned earlier that, you know, we have different birds, different species in different states. Um, in general, I think of them as, as actors. In this case, they're birds, but you know, in music that has nothing to do with birds or little to do with birds, you know, they have other names. And so this state column up here on the, uh, up here is uh, the actor name and a particular state that they can be in. Um, there's a, a distribution function which can't really see here, but it's basically a weighted curve so that um, choices that involve uh, randomness can be given a shape, you know, to your liking as, as a composer. And then there is a range of time delay until the next time that actor in that state makes another sound. And that range can be tight, it can be very big. Um, and that just depends on the kind of behavior that you're after for that particular actor. Um, and I tend to use, within a range, I tend to use a shape that is sort of inverse normal. You know, that is, um, it's a bit higher on the low numbers, that is uh, low delay, so, you know, fast uh, voicing. And then it's kind of lowest, lower in the middle, and then it gets higher in the long numbers for more weight um, until the next sound. And I find that that kind of gives a, a naturalness that I like that varies both the kind of acute uh, activity with more laid back activity and tends to reduce the kind of random mechanical sound you sometimes experience with randomly generated things. Um, the next two columns, uh, like this 24 and seeking, 24 is just the, and these numbers are in seconds, 24 is just the time that a given bird will stay in that state once it's in that state. And after that timer expires at 24 seconds, it'll move into the next state. 
And that next state can be the same state. So you could basically have something that stays in the same state, or it could go to silence, a silent state, or some other state. And in this way, you, you can kind of have a, a, a variety of expression across a period of time, or not. You could have some, some uh, actors that are in such a cycle and others that are not. Um, and I'll get to it in a minute, but there's also the possibility to, for one actor to affect another actor's uh, state, to change it. And that's where things get kind of interesting. And then to Greg's table, uh, to, to Greg's question, there's a, a sounds table. And in it, there's an actor column, there's a state column, and there's stuff over here that I sometimes use in Unity, but does not pertain uh, in the Max world. And then there are just uh, path names to, to sound files. And so basically what this is saying is for Red Wing, it has three sounds that it will draw from if it's in the agitated state. And, you know, on down, on down, the, uh, on down the file. And some of these files are quite long. I just pulled these out for you know, illustration. Some of them have lots of, <laughs> lots of states, lots of sounds. Um, this last one down here uh, kind of sets up what I want to show you next. And that's, I call it the behavior table. It's really more of an interactions table. It's how different uh, birds, different actors can affect each other. And so the nomenclature is basically, if you're a wedding wing in the seeking uh, state and a crow makes a sound in their call state, then you might be nudged into your agitated state. And the might be depends on these values in here, which um, weight, proximity. So if the bird is really close to you, it's probably going to have more effect than if it was far, far away. And they also weight uh, time. So if you're, if you're getting hit with a lot of uh, calls from a bird that, you know, right after each, right after, one after the other, that's going to have more effect than if they're, you know, much more sporadic. And so this gives a, um, this gives a way for the ensembles, if you will, to interact. And it gives you some way to express their sensitivity to others or not. Yeah, Greg, you had a question? Yeah, um, so the behavior table, then is that thing that perturbs the, um, the state table to get it in a different state? Uh, it doesn't perturb the state table, but it'll perturb a bird that happens to be in a particular state, potentially into another state. And that new state, the bird will look at the state table to find out what's the delay time next time. But it doesn't look and see if it's in that state or not. When the state that it enters expires, it will look to see what the next state is. And that, sorry? When was that? When, uh, when it's in a particular state and that state expires, that is, it hits that, um, uh, that timeout, then it'll move into the next state, whatever that happens to be. So then it doesn't care what's in, what's in the uh, status table at that point? Status table? Yeah, does it ignore the state in the status table? There's no status table on our extension. Excuse me, state table. Sorry, Lee. The state table does not change. So None of these tables change unless, you know, I'm using an app to do that. I'm just trying to figure out, is, is that just a starting point to define what state the bird can be in in this example? And then is it the behavior table that after a while does this continue with driving and take things in a different state? Oh, I, maybe I understand your question wrong. Please. Could, could I put it this way? Are you sure. asking, are all the states represented in the behavior table also represented in the state table? Yes. It's a closed world in that regard. Okay, but the, the state table is just a springboard, and when things get rolling, then the behavior table takes over? You, you could say that, and the, the lead actors might have no behavior to find, and they just kind of roll along in their, you know, in yeah. just interacting. I'm just trying to make things more concrete, because this is pretty abstract. 
It is abstract. Yeah. It's not, I, I'm not going to put it in the escape table, but I'm going to. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, let's go on to the next demonstration because that's what I'm really needing is I need it. Um, see. Oh, and just to kind of finish that off a little bit um, while we're here, those tables, you know, are kind of underneath the hood. Um, but the actual bird uh, objects and flock objects have components that I've added that, you know, facilitate all this, that can implement all this. And so that's that's how that's done. And so these are just part of the operation of each of the birds um, during their normal you know, flying around. Okay. Wait, the bird components in where? Inside a bird. Okay. This has nothing to do with this point in Unity? In Unity. Okay. So we still have some sort of nebulous cloud of mist of Unity that's affecting all this, so that's all we're doing. What, what I've been showing you with the blocks and the data and the model of sound and states, behavior, that's all in Unity. None of that is in Max. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah, all that Max is doing is, is taking uh, really three commands, a reset, a play, and a position. That's all that Max is doing. It's just a dispersion engine, a tanner. So let, let me go on to this next one. the whole point, right? Because we want to get the, the spatial mapping in here in Cle, and Max is how I'm doing that. But in Max, um, and I have, a, I'm, I'm observing the same coordinate system with the same uh, unit of measure. I'm working in meters in each case. And so they are, uh, they kind of have this out of band agreement, if you will, <laughs> that we're talking about the same space. But Within Max, there's no notion of flocks. Mm -hmm. There's no notion of actors. Yeah. There's just sounds with paths. Yeah. And a play command, play it. Yeah. And a channel number, play it on that channel. Yeah. So essentially, Unity is sending all of the changes to data. Unity's doing all that. Yeah, but but just but just the file the f the sound file name that's played on channel fourteen, let's say, and the X Y Z position of the object in Unity on channel fourteen. So that X Y Z position and that path name to this file, you know, to the sound file to play, those are what are being sent to Max. That's all. Yes, that's it. And that's where I've written all my code. I mean, I've written these max patches, but most of the code is, you know, for all this music, for the music, <laughs> for the musical modeling is, is, in, is in C Sharp and Unity. Yeah, that's yeah. That okay. And so what I want to show you here is, um, and this I think will probably be our last one. I don't know how we're doing on time. Probably not that great. But um, um, if we're short on, if we have lots of time, I have more I can show. But I want to show you this one because uh, my goal all along has been in making these generative ecologies, if you will, is I'm not an ornithologist. I'm not, a, I'm not trying to be. I'm not a scientist. I'm not trying to assert any particular um, you know, uh, correct model of animal behavior. 
but I love the sound of the birds. I love the sound of being in the forest. And I'm trying to make something that sounds to my untrained ears feasible, you know, plausible, kind of natural. Uh, and that's where the stochastics come from. That's where the, you know, the kind of the distribution, the probability distributions, very probability distributions all playing together come together. But I also, my goal is musical. I, I want to listen to it and I want to have the same satisfaction from listening to it that I do from the music I like the most. You know, it's a different kind of, it's a different thing, but that's, that's my goal. And so with this project here, it's the first one I've done um, where I'm using instrumental sounds. And so I'm thinking of it in terms of different groups, almost like a, a, a cast list in, a, in theater. But instead of individual actors, you've got groups of actors that kind of move together. And they have relationships, like those relationships that I showed you. Uh, some of the relationships are supportive. You know, if you, if you make a sound and you're near me and I'm in a stressed state, I'm going to come out of my stressed state probably, you know, given the kind of rubber stochastics of, you know, the, the probability. Um, and vice versa, if you are, uh, from my perspective, a predator, or you have a relationship that I've defined as threatening in some manner, or dominant in some manner, um, I might go from my current state to silent state, right? And so that took me to the point of um, trying to make music from that. And I used as the source material, um, I played a violin and I was um, doing improvisations for a friend of mine, a friend David Perper in uh, New Jersey, we collaborate. And he said, can you play something over this um, in you know, A pentatonic, major pentatonic? Okay, yeah. So I did that, and then I did some things that were kind of um, not, you know, that were kind of around that, but not, not staying in the in major pentatonic. And I went through all those, and we didn't use them for the project we were doing, but I went through and I cut them out, and I grouped them into groups that I felt like were a family, families of players that like to play together, <laughs> you know? And so they might be from the same town. They might kind of talk the same way. <laughs> they might, you know, and they might have different states that reflect whether, you know, they're happy or not. Um, and, and then I kind of bifurcated those, those set of groups into, into two. One that was more consonant which hit all the, you know, the major pentatonic kind of riffs. And the other one that was more dissonant, which were the places I was playing around. And, um, and then I thought, okay, well, I'd like to hear y'all play together. And, uh, but I'd like to play with you. How can we do this? And so what I started, what I started to experiment with is, um, using pitch detection um, on, you know, an audio signal. In my case, it's, I'm playing the violin, but, it, you know, it's an audio signal. And I've associated certain pitches with, uh, in one case off from the a pentatonic scale, with different groups that are more in the consonant group. And then from a kind of an augmented whole tone scale, um, associated different pitches with more th those in the dissonant group. And then there's also a pitch for each to basically turn them off or, or you know, kind of inhibit them. I have one really large group that I can also trigger. It'll come in and out from time to time anyway. And on the phone, if you shake the phone, it comes out, which is nice. I'm kind of working the gestural stuff. Um, and so that's what this one is about. And I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to play it for you, all right? And I'm going to see if I can get my violin working and um, see if we can get the show that as well. Let's see. Let's make sure.
And for this one, the visual is there, but that's just because in a phone app, I gotta do something visually. To me, it's to listen to, so if you feel like moving around or you have a space you'd like to get to and just close your eyes and, and listen, I think is the best advice. Thank you. Um, questions? Yeah. So there was an occasional burst of movement. Was that when you were playing two strings, or was there overtones coming in? Was the, the burst of movement in terms of what was happening with the uh, things moving around? At one point, um, it, it didn't have anything to do with the number of strings. Um, if I play an F, natural, 
if the large group isn't already in play, it'll it'll start up. Um, and it goes also for smaller groups. Um, on the consonant side, if I if I were to play uh, an A, the pitch class, any any octave, B or C sharp or E, I I could stimulate uh, one of those consonant groups to start up. And it might have just been that. Uh, it was in a silent mode, and but it was still flying around, and then, uh, you know, it triggered by, by the, uh, by the pitch I played, triggered it to, to actually show up. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Greg, yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's true. You could hook up, you know, some kind of joystick or something. In fact, what I often do is, um, I don't often do it, but I have done it. This, this display over here in Max, this is from uh, ICST. I used to, I started out um, using their ambisonic uh, encoder, decoder to do this. And, um, this is the visual tool that they have for it. And I don't use the decoder or the encoder unless I want ambisonics. But I've, I've, I've kept this. And one thing you can do is you can, you can, grab, <laughs> you can grab the objects and, and move them around. So, you, I mean, you can, even, you can even do it just within the max patch if that's what you're after. Totally. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I think I think a lot of this are probably curious about how the system works. Number one, they get that in the system, and number two, once you get to the system, what do you need to be able to rethink around? And it seems like you come up with a nice way of doing single point smoothing of sound. I think that's what makes it. Of course, that's only one way to do things. Thank you. Yeah, I think it, I think it could be a utility, and I um, I have a GitHub that uh, I've put this in, but I haven't put this one in yet. I, it, it, it's still it needs it's it's not really finished. Um, the other thing I will say, um, and this is <laughs> Teresa would say, do you know that? Have you ever heard of the term wet blanket? But um, I just recently when I use SPAT, I use EarCam, you know, in in, in Paris. I use their SPAT library for playing sounds because it's so much more robust than SF Play in Max. And I, I ran into this when I had a, um, when we were recording Gamelon uh, at, at ESS and Alex and Gwizian did all the recording of Pak Nuru, if you saw the, the puppet show here back in May, did all the dubbing. And so we wound up with, um, by the time they all kind of put together, about 30, 30 tracks, about 30 stems and wanted to animate those. And I was able to do it with Unity and Max, but um, SF Play and Max couldn't handle that, that kind of a file, but, but SPAT did. So I'm a, I was a convert, you know, so now I use SPAT for that. But I've learned recently that SPAT is really much more than that, which I, I didn't really grasp. And it does a lot of the stuff which you know, my, uh, my Max patch does and more. So, I'm going to be looking at that and think and see if I could just move to that, um, but I, I don't really know if there's a if there's a feature gap between what I'm doing here and what what SPAT does. Yeah, I've got a theory about that myself. There's a there's a guy from France and his name escapes me right now, but uh, he's got a thing he's talking. It's a it's a mesh for live. Can anybody not hear me? Uh, the internet. Huh? The internet. Yeah. Let's not leave the people in cyberspace hanging. So there's a guy from France, um, and I think his first name is Eve, but Ives, whatever, I, I can't remember his last name. Uh, I'll dig it up some point. But he has a system built on SPAT, which I believe is a Max for Live plugin. 
So since he's done the heavy lifting to get it into Max for Live, um, you know, he's charging for it. And I don't remember how much it is. I don't think it's a whole lot. But the point is, um, I, I, he, we connected on Facebook over another post he had. And one of the things that I found, in most cases, most localization programs, especially things that plug in to live, the M4L plugins, they do not handle a planar grid system like this, okay? Because there's special considerations for this. And so he, he seems to think that, that XP would work in that situation, so I'm waiting back to hear from him, but it's built on SPAT. So I'm kind of looking at SPAT myself. But um, I, do you know anything about the, the UI? Is it, does it enable you to put speakers in arbitrary uh, configurations? Like, I mean, can you, can you take it to, uh, and like, make some for the uh, Acousmanium or whatever they call that multi hundred speaker system? Um, they use all kinds of speaker configurations at Intercom. Um, and, uh, you know, walls, grids, um, you know, wave field, um, spheres, and so on. And SPAT, you can, you can indicate speaker location, XYZ or, or you know, azimuth. Um, so, so, yeah, I don't, think, I don't think that's an issue. It might be with the, with the live patch. But, uh, and bringing up live kind of brings me to a question. I mean, I'm, of course, I love talking about my stuff if you have questions about it. But as I said in the beginning, uh, we're doing this so that you can take away something useful from it. So... Um, would this be a time to kind of transition to just more open-ended? Yeah. Let's everybody give a hand to Bill Peratt. <laughs> that was uh, way over my head, but I loved every second of it. Hopefully you guys absorbed some of it. We're going to have the, uh, all this available for you to check out again. And, uh, you know, for the next hour or so, we're going to be hanging out. Bill's going to hang out. I'm hanging out. We're all hanging out. A little more casual. I'm going to turn the stream off. Um, you can come up here and sort of casually talk to Bill. Let's explore the system. If you have any questions about getting in here and uh, working on the system yourself, you can talk to me about that. Um, other than that, let's just sort of hang out and talk about Cleet, talk about spatial sound. Um, really appreciate you guys coming here. If you've never been here before, it's Elastic Arts. Uh, we do about five or six things a week. Um, everything from jazz to performance art to film to just everything under the sun. Um, mostly leaning in the experimental direction, um, exploratory direction. We have a mailing list over here. Um, we'd love you to sign up. I write it every week. It's really brilliant. It's a beautiful newsletter. Uh, just once a week. Um, would love to tell you more about everything that's happening here. Um, thank you so much for coming, and let's hang out. Thank you, Ben. Ben said something that I wanted to show you, and I'll, I'm sorry, I'll just one last short thing. Uh, in case it isn't crystal clear, uh, it's just a 16-channel amp system. And this is a file, it's a WAV file with 16 channels in it. Uh, I couldn't get Audacity to play it, but um, QuickTime was fine. Oh, t way too loud. I'm sorry about that. Well, you get the point. If you can come up with a 16-channel file, it's nice to have 17 for the for the you know for the subs. Um, but if you can come up with a 16-channel file, however you do it, you can play it in here. <laughs> okay.